Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to have you along to our webinar today where we are talking about managing sprobolus species and other weedy grasses in pastures and what the learnings are from Florida. So I'll now call upon Wayne Vogler, uh, a senior weed scientist with DAF in Queensland, Charters Towers, to further outline the topic and introduce our guest speaker for today. Wayne, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we have with us uh, Dr. Brent Sellers, who's a pasture weed specialist from the University of Florida, and uh, they have some very similar issues in Florida to, to the ones we have in uh, particularly Queensland and uh, northern New South Wales with sporobolus, or we call them rat style grasses. And uh, um, Brent's just going to talk about how they manage them in Florida, and uh, then we'll have some questions, I assume, after that. So I'm going to hand over to Brent now. All right, thanks, Wayne, and thank you, everyone, for attending today. So what I thought I'd do this morning, or this afternoon, I should say, is I'd give you a little bit of background on Florida, uh, some of the pasture species that we have, and then really focus on what we call smut grass in Florida, so the sporobolus, the giant rat's tail, whatever you want to call it, we call it smut grass. Um, <clears throat> and really focus on the management strategies that we've used over the past several years and how we're, we think we're improving, we hope we're going in the right direction, and then end with some of the current research that we're, we are focusing on. So believe it or not, um, our predominant forage in Florida is bahia grass, um, paspalum notatum. Um, so much different than here, where everybody considers this a weed, we consider this like a desirable species. It is planted in over 2 million hectares in our state and first introduced in the 1930s, and there have been improvements. So two major cultivars would be Pensacola bahia grass and the second, most second popular part would be Argentine bahia grass. And uh, like I said, those are the most predominant species. <clears throat> as forage. We also have Bermuda grass that's used predominantly for hay production. And then the other two grasses that we, we refer to as limpo grass and star grass are from Africa and imported for the wetter parts of the state or, or the more humid parts of the state. So the black line in the map, uh, uh, that's basically the southern part of the state would be a more subtropical or tro tropical environment. And the northern part of the state up into the panhandle of Florida would be more of a temperate region, if you will. So the limpo grass and star grass would be more found in the southern part of the state. And the star grass is usually found on uh, dairies, grazing dairies. And we do have other species. Uh, the annual rye grass would be grown in the winter for us more so up in the northern part of the state, but we do have people in the southern part of the state that will use it as well. And then also some legumes, uh, clovers in the north part of the state, and some perennial peanut cultivars in the southern part of the state, as well as some others like ash nominee or sun hemp, uh, carpon desmodium, and others. So, but we're here today mainly to talk about smut grass. So this picture is a pretty common sight. Uh, across Florida really, uh, but especially in South Florida. So this is a pasture I feel that the producer could revive uh, with some chemical applications over time. Um, but there are pastures that are much, much worse than this uh, throughout the state um, where there'll be 100% smut grass. And at that point in time, they really need to think about renovation or figuring out something else to do. So in Florida, we do have two different species, um, at least two. Uh, we have small smut grass, which is Sporobolus indicus, and then more recently, giant smut grass, and there's differences in opinion as to what this actually is, uh, but so far, they've kind of settled on Sporobolus jacamontii. Uh, both, they believe, were introduced from tropical Asia and it's named for the fungus that attacks the seed head. And uh, small smut grass was the predominant species in the state, but has since been pretty much dis displaced by giant smut grass. And uh, biology on small smut grass suggests that both species produce around 45,000 seeds per plant, if not more for the giant uh, variety. 
and that seeds remain viable for at least two years. So the only real way to tell them apart is to look at the seed heads. There are some biological differences in clump size and height, but that can be really variable depending on where these plants are growing. So we really focus on the seed heads for identification. So small smut grass has more pressed uh, panicles, so they look spike-like. And giant smut grass, uh, the branches are more open in nature. So that's the easiest way for us to tell these two species apart. And so far, these are the only two species that are problematic uh, in our state. We do have a total of 11 species that belong in the Sporobolus genus, but they don't really cross over that often between natural areas and improved pastures. So this just kind of shows you the timeline. Um, 1950s, so a lot of the pastures in Florida started to become improved in the 40s and 50s. And that's when small smut grass was first noticed as a serious weed in Florida. By the 70s, about 75% of improved pastures were infested. And then by the 1990s, we discovered giant smut grass, which has since pretty much displaced small smut grass throughout the state and continues to move uh, northward. We still do find small smut grass in the northern part of the state and in isolated areas in the southern part of the state. But by and far, giant smut grass has become the predominant smut grass species. So chemically, uh, we do not have the propionate in the U.S., um, which is task force here, but we do have Velpar um, with the active ingredient hexazinone. And we've pretty much determined over the past 20 years or so that you need about three and a half liters per hectare minimum. But to get the best control, most often you need to apply 4.7 liters per hectare. Uh, we need to apply this during the summer rainy, rainy season because the herbicide needs to be incorporated into the soil because most uptake is through the roots. And then translocation would be through the xylem or with the water into the plant. So as with fupropionate here, once we do control the, the smut grass of the rat's tail, we do end up with uh, large open spots, so we end up trading one weed problem with another, or you get more sporophyllis back in those same localized areas. This is also our most expensive herbicide, uh, about $70 per hectare, which is about two and a half times more expensive than any of the products we use for broadleaf weed control. And uh, thankfully, there's no longer a grazing restriction. That used to be 60 days, and that did uh, make some of our producers not use this product, but even since this has been removed, it's still been a challenging product to use, and you'll see why as we proceed uh, through this presentation today. So, <clears throat> a lot of the questions that the producers asked when I first came to the university in 2005 was, how can they increase long-term control uh, of smut grass because they can spray it with Belpar get decent control, but three years or maybe even four years down the road, the smut grass population has increased to a density that may be just as bad, if not worse, than their original infestation. So we decided to look at some different uh, ways to uh, manage this long term. So we looked at three different treatment programs onto a pasture that had about three plants per square meter. Now, the first treatment program was Velpar at 4.7 liters per hectare, so that is our uh, most often recommended rate. Our second, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was glyphosate at 9.4 liters per hectare. So this would result in complete death of everything in those plots. We let the vegetation die back, started tillage operations, and then overseeded those plots uh, with the hay grass seed. And then our last treatment uh, was a fall roller chopping treatment. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second so you get an appreciation for what a roller chopper is. So we started off with three plants per square meter across the entire experiment. We initiated these treatments in 2008, came back in in 2009. And we see that the Velpar treatment resulted in less than a half of a plant per square meter. Surprisingly, the fall roller chopping treatment performed similarly to the Velpar application. And I'll explain why that happened, why we believe that happened in a second. 
But where we renovated plots, we saw the complete opposite of what we want. So we don't want to double our smut grass population, but that is what happened with renovation initially. So after we recorded these counts in 2009, we applied Velpar at a half rate across the entire experiment and came back in 2010 and we further depleted our smut grass population in the Velpar only plots, further depleted the smut grass population in the fall roller chopping plots, but also did a very good job on the young seedlings in the plots where we renovated. So this shows our producers that if we do renovate a pasture that had a significant amount of smut grass in it, you're not going to answer or solve the problem by renovation. You have to come back the year after treatment and apply a year after um, reseeding and apply Velpar to help keep that smut grass population at bay. If we go out one more year in this study, we see that the Velpar treatments uh, only are still holding on. But, but we're seeing a slight uptick in the smut grass population where we disturb the soil. So that's kind of <clears throat> where that study ended. Unfortunately, we didn't carry that out any further. Probably in 2012, all these plots could receive another Velpar treatment and uh, continue to uh, keep the smut grass at bay in those plots. So I promised a picture of a roller chopper. That's what that piece of equipment looks like. These are very large drums that are filled with water with these blades that dig into the soil. So as this rolls across the landscape, it would actually pick up the clumps of the smut grass and basically uproot them. And since we had such a dry fall, those clumps desiccated and we ended up with lots of smut grass in those plots. So that's how that worked overall. So the next one uh, we looked at is so we looked at uh, what we thought from some of the observations we had along roadsides and other areas is that if we could use animals to weaken the plants, the smut grass plants, and possibly use decreased rates of Velpar in these plots. So we went to a pasture in, in late winter, which would have been February, early March for us, and uh, burned half of the pasture, left the other half unburned had two different stocking rates and we waited about two weeks after the burning operation then we rotationally grazed these plots for one week let them rest for three weeks and we went um, with four to five uh, rotations so grazing cycles after the initial burning so I'm not going to show you a lot of data on this uh, because graphs get boring. So I'll show you a few pictures uh, from this. So the top picture, uh, this is showing the smut grass plots after a one week grazing event. So they are using the, the smut grass uh, in these burned plots, but where the plots were left unburned, they're pretty much leaving that smut grass untouched. It's very unpalatable to them, uh, but they will readily graze the tender regrowth after burning. So unfortunately, our pretreatment burning and grazing had no effect on smut grass control with the Velpar, regardless of rate. But we felt this was because of excessive rainfall that was received within a week after application, both years that we did this trial, unfortunately. Uh, in one year, we had eight inches of rainfall within the week of application. And the next time we did this, we had over five inches of rainfall within a week of application. So we basically leached the herbicide below the root zone of the smut grass. We ended up with very poor control. But <clears throat> we wanted to confirm this. So uh, my PhD student that is with me in Australia right now, Jose, he uh, did some work in the greenhouse where we grew smut grass in four liter uh, size pots and field soil let them get rather large, and then we spray 4.7 liters per hectare of Velpar under these plants, let them dry for four hours, then simulated rainfall from zero to 20 centimeters. And for the greenhouse data, it pretty much shows us if we have no rainfall, we have poor control, and we get above two and a half centimeters of rainfall, we have poor control. So under greenhouse conditions, somewhere between 0.6 and 2.5 centimeters, 
we get great uh, control using the Velpar, but beyond that, we end up with very poor control. So greenhouse conditions are, are fine, but we destroy uh, a lot of the micro and macro pores in the soil, so we don't really get a good representation of what could happen under field conditions. So we did do this under the field condition um, for two years so far. This is only showing one year of data. This is 30 days after treatment. So we know pretty quickly after application how good the Velpar treatments are going to work. So what we did in this study is we went out every Friday, uh, sprayed Velpar at 4.7 liters per hectare, and collected rainfall for seven days after the application. So these bars, the blue and red bars, indicate our visual estimates of smut grass control from zero to 100%. And then the orange line is the amount of rainfall that was received for seven days after application. So for example, we applied on April 22nd. So this amount of rainfall, which is about 2.3, 2.4 centimeters, was received from April 22nd to April 26th. So basically what this graph is telling us that if we have no rainfall, like on April 26th, or greater than 12 centimeters on June 3rd, or again, no rainfall on July 1st, we end up with 50% or less control. And with that level of control, 30 days after treatment, we've observed in the past that it completely regrows by the next growing season. So we know that that's going to be a control failure. But otherwise, if we're somewhere between 0.6 and seven and a half or seven centimeters under field conditions, it appears we're going to end up with some fairly decent control so that ranchers can then focus on another application the following year and try to keep on working on those plants. So this is uh, smut grass on the left at the day of application. So this just gives you an idea of how quickly the Belpar works in, under field conditions. In 30 days, we, we know it's going to be dead or not. So in this plot, it actually worked except where we had a little bit of a skip with the boom. So what I'm telling uh, my producers in Florida right now is to use two-year programs at least versus a one-year. Uh, we can't really uh, spray one year and hope for the best. I really think they need to be more proactive and it use at least a two-year program. And if their pasture is more than 70% infested with smut grass, we do suggest renovation, but they have to come back the following year after planting with another Velpar treatment at a reduced rate to help clean that up. We do feel that rotational grazing should help with control, uh, but due to excessive rainfall, we haven't really been able to confirm this. And rainfall is necessary, but too much is also bad. Uh, so, we can't control rainfall, but if we could, we'd be a step in the right direction. So, um, another issue that I guess uh, some of the ranchers in Florida have been dealing with in, in some locations is that they have so much smut grass that they've uh, kind of given up because they can't afford to renovate every pasture that they have. So, one of the things they've been doing has been going out and mowing paddocks and waiting two weeks and grazing their cattle on those paddocks. But they have to continuously mow them because the smut grass grows so quickly during our summer rainy season that it gets ahead of the cattle, becomes unpalatable, then we start having some weight gain issues. So this particular ranch had asked me if there was a way that they could slow down smut grass regrowth. And I said there probably is, and this use of glyphosate as basically a chemical mowing treatment. So we applied uh, 0.15 of, all the way up to 2.4 liters per hectare <clears throat> on a smut grass infested pasture. And all of them basically reduced the regrowth of the smut grass, uh, but really started at 0.3 liters per hectare. And this is where also where we saw a lot of seed head uh, production reduced on the smut grass. So we felt that the 0.3 liters per hectare was probably good enough uh, in this situation, in the grazing situation, where they're trying to actually use it. But what was interesting to me was the 2.4 liter per hectare rate. Because if we look at the next slide, where we have 
no glyphosate, and compare that to 2.4 liters per hectare, we see about 85 to 90 percent brownout. Um, and actually, I have some ranchers that have used this rate as a quote selective treatment in bahia grass pastures, and they are fairly satisfied with the level of control. They do this two years in a row, and they've been uh, they've happily, they say, eradicated their smut grass from those individual pastures. Now, they probably have small plants still, um, and that's something that they'll probably continue to battle over the years. But this is one option that we are looking at currently as a selective means to control smut grass and bahia grass pastures. Another thing that we are currently looking at is the use of a weed wiper. So the one in this picture is what we call a roto wiper that's produced in the, in the U.S. And for most of our grass species uh, that we consider weedy grasses, we can use a 10% solution and selectively remove them with the wiper. But you have to wipe in two, two directions. And a lot of people get frustrated with this technology because it takes a little bit of practice. It's kind of more of an art form than it is a, a scientific form. Uh, for a spray application or a herbicide application. So what some of our producers have done is use the foam, foam marker solution poured in with the herbicide so it makes the roller actually foamy. So you can actually see how wet that roller is to ensure that you're getting enough material on those plants. So this is a pasture at my research center where we did wipe the 10% solution in two directions. On This is actually the small sweat grass variety. Um, and this looked very good for about um, one growing season. We went out the next growing season to look at these, this pasture, and every clump had grown back. So we discovered that 10% is enough. So part of Jose's current work is to figure out what concentration we do need to have in that wiper system to end up with effective control. And then another uh, thing is, a lot of people are interested in biocontrol. Um, this is very difficult because the biocontrol agents have to be very specific for them to be able to be released, in, at least in the United States. Uh, but this is a situation where this is actually an endemic population of an insect that was damaging smut grass. So these brown areas um, on your right that are circled these are plants that have been browned out um, by this little insect that we found covering the leaves and all over the soil surface. And these are called chinch bugs. And the genus is Blissus. And this is actually a pretty terrible pest for us in the lawn care and turf industry, as well as in hay production fields. Uh, so we're not really sure where this insect came from or why it's starting to attack smut grass. It could be it's because there's just so much smut grass in this area that it's decided to start feeding on it, and it could cross back over into our desirable species. So we have some more work on this species to figure out, you know, do we need to actually control this chinch bug, or is it something that can be further utilized down the road? And then potentially we may have a third species, this taller one that's on the right-hand side. Uh, it's much more robust and much taller than our what we refer to as our giant species. So uh, we have sent this in for identification and it comes back with the same species, which I have a hard time believing. Uh, but they're the experts on the taxonomy, so that's what we have to go with right now until we learn otherwise. So our current research is we're, we continue on the rainfall studies and we finished up the fire grazing and hexazinone study for now. We're, we continue to look at the wiper as a selective treatment of using uh, either glyphosate or hexazinone. And some of the other studies that we're looking at are impregnating dry fertilizer with, with hexazinone. And I'm really interested in this to see if we end up with better activity after a heavy rainfall versus a broadcast li liquid application of Belfar. We're also looking at tank mixing residual herbicides for increased long-term control, so help control the seedlings. And then the last two I've touched on, using smut grass as a forage and using glyphosate as a selective treatment. 
And I believe that ends this portion of the presentation.